Ruchem Aboyim. Welcome everyone to our home. Um, it's been, I think it's been about a month, so uh, we need to get back into it. And uh, we're still going to deal with some ideas that dealt with the holidays. Um, and I guess some of these are universal anyways. So uh, let us begin. So the uh, lecture this week is called Why Happiness on Sukkot? Now, this week, um, this week on my thoughts, I would like to examine as to why the term mentions the words simcha, joy. I just want to make sure that symbol on the, on the screen is okay. Oh, yeah, it's for right tagging friends. Face. Yeah, it's just for tagging friends. You know, I don't, everybody. No, there you go. Yeah. Okay, sorry for the interruption. I want to make sure the technical thing's right. Let's start again. Let's begin again. So this week on My Thoughts, I would like to examine as to why the Torah mentions the word simcha, joy, three times in connection with the holiday of Sukkot, whereas with the holiday of Shavuot, uh, the Torah mentions joy only once. With the holiday of Pesach, there is no mention of joy whatsoever. Again, the Shalosh and the Gaon, the three festivals. So what is so special about the holiday of Sukkot, that the Torah instructed us to experience more joy than on any other of the holidays. Now, of course, there's a simple and logical answer. We are, by design, an agricultural nation. Our heritage and our destiny are both connected with the land. So many of the laws of the Torah deal with farming the soil, requirements as to what the farmer must perform after the harvest and the observance of the laws of charity that were connected with the produce. So when the holiday of Sukkot arrived, the farmer would have finished all the tasks that were necessary for him to perform so that he would be able to bring his crops to market. Uh, he was finished for the year. Uh, the season was over and he could now basically relax. He was then commanded to go up to Yerushalayim, to Jerusalem, and rejoice with God in his temple. He was there to see God, but also to be seen by God. The farmer was there to offer prayers and sacrifices as a sort of form of gratitude to God his Father, and to thank him for all the revealed blessings that God had bestowed upon him. But I really think that there's much more that we can learn from this holiday. Uh, lessons that we can trace back to our ancestors who were redeemed from the oppressive slavery in Egypt. A deeper and more spiritual lesson. You know, when the Jews left Egypt, they traveled in the desert for 49 days. Then on the 50th day, they received the Torah on Mount Sinai from God Almighty himself. Moshe went up to the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments. And while he was gone, the nation sinned grievously. They made the golden calf. And immediately after that sin, the clouds of glory that had protected the nation on all six sides were removed. There was even talk by God Almighty of destroying the entire nation and starting all over again, again with Moshe. But in the end, not only does God forgive the people for their grievous sin, he even instructs Moshe to tell them that he, God Almighty himself, wanted them to build him what we call a dir of a a dwelling place for him in this lower world. He indicated that even though they had sinned grievously, still, he was their father. And as a sign of his deep love and affection for the nation, he asked to be brought even closer to them, closer than he had ever been before. So we see that through that grievous sin, we became even closer to God, our Father in heaven, closer than we had ever been before. A Yerida L'Tzorach a descent, so that we could reach a higher ascent. You know, I became a Balchuva when my son was born. In reality, he changed my life. I walked out of a delivery room and I became an Orthodox Jew. He made me look at myself. I had to ask myself the tough question. If he grows up to be who I am now, will that be good enough? The answer was no. And so I changed my lifestyle for him. We became very close. The first word that my son spoke was, Daddy. Well, it melted my heart. Due to our close and loving relationship, he took on certain liberties. Uh, there existed a deep love between us, but not necessarily the proper amount of awe. 
It happened the one time he was taking advantage of my mother's good nature, and I told him to stop. Well, he continued. So I then told him that I was going to count to ten, and if he didn't stop, I would be forced to punish him. I counted one, two, three, and then he said four, five, six. I then proceeded to spank him, and he cried. It was the first time that I had ever felt the need to do so. After I spanked him, I went into another room and I cried. I thought that I had destroyed, or at least jeopardized, our close relationship. But somehow, I found the opposite to be true. You know, after I spanked him, we actually became even closer than before. Somehow, showing him that I cared enough for him, that I was able to administer tough love, increased the love between the two of us, rather than diminished it. A bond that Baruch Hashem still exists today. In reality, we should be eating our matzah in a sukkah. After all, whether one follows the opinion that the holiday commemorates the huts that God made for them to live in as they travel through the wilderness, which would follow the opinion of Rabbi Akiva, or to commemorate the clouds of glory that surrounded them on all six sides and enveloped them throughout their 40-year journey, which would follow the opinion of Rabbi Eleazar. In either case, both opinions would connect with the holiday at Pesach, so why do we celebrate Sukkot six months later? As I mentioned before, when the Jews sinned with the golden calf, the clouds of glory were removed. However, when the nation began to construct the tabernacle, then the clouds returned. That date was the 15th day of the Hebrew month of Tishrei. So we now had another reason to celebrate. After all, God could have waited until the nation had finished constructing the tabernacle. He did not. Immediately, as they began construction, the clouds of glory returned. This had to be a welcome sight, both spiritually and physically. Spiritually, after all, for three months, they had been forced to deal with the loss of the Shekhinah, the divinity of God, in their midst. With the beginning of the construction of the tabernacle, the Shekhinah returned. Physically, for the three-month period, they were forced to weather the natural elements of, in the desert. With the return of the clouds of glory, they once again were able to live in a state of serenity, a, a taste of Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden. You know, one can only imagine that after losing the clouds for three months, that their return would naturally engender a deeper appreciation, far greater than they would have ever felt before. Again, another reason to rejoice. You know, we also learn a, a great lesson in life. Once we begin our repentance, tshuva to God, our Father in heaven, then it will, he, will always, our Father, he will always be there to help us on our path. As it says, that in the way that a person wants to travel, heaven, meaning God Almighty, will assist him. You know, the Bnei Yisachar states that the Hebrew word sukkah is an acronym for four words that are somet v'ozer kol hanoflim that is he who supports and assists all who fall. When a Jew fulfills the mitzvah of sukkah, God assists him in all that he does. God holds him by the hand, so to speak, like any loving father. This also connects to the high holidays and the concept of tshuva and kapara, of repentance and forgiveness. There is a question that is asked, which is interesting. Immediately after we have finished reciting the last prayer on Yom Kippur, the Nila, we begin to pray the Maariv, the evening prayer. In the Amida that we recite in one of the 13 requests, we ask God Almighty, Shalach Lanu Avinu Kichotanu, that forgive us our Father for we have sinned. But the question that we have to ask is, isn't that a blessing in vain? After all, what sin could we have possibly transgressed? After all, we haven't moved from our seat. The answer given is that the sin that we have transgressed is that we did not truly believe that God our Father has forgiven us for all our sins. We do not believe in ourselves. This connects to the question as to why were the Jews forced to wander in the desert for 40 years? Simple answer is they, sl they sinned with the slander of the spies. That, of course, is true. But what the incident of the spies really accomplished was that it exposed a deep flaw that existed in the nation that left Egypt as the Rambam states, that they were a slave nation with a slave mentality. 
their sin was not that they didn't believe in God. No. Their sin was they did not believe in themselves. They did not think that they were worthy of all the miracles that God would have had to perform on their behalf so they would be able to not only conquer but inhabit the land. God, so to speak, had no choice but to have them wander in the desert until all that generation died out. Their lack of belief, their lack of self-esteem had to be buried in the desert. This amputation of sorts was necessary so that their children could emerge with, emerge with a true belief in themselves, a, a true sense of confidence and an unshakable belief in God Almighty, their Father in Heaven. After all, think about it. They grew up experiencing all of his miracles each and every day of their lives, starting with the mun, the spiritual food that fell daily from heaven. Then there was the well of Miriam, the sea of water that accompanied them on their travels throughout the desert. That was in addition to the clouds of glory that protected them on all four sides of the compass from the elements. And there was another cloud that hovered above them and afforded them protection from the sun during the day and the cold during the night. The sixth cloud was spread like a carpet that was under their feet. The Torah states that their shoes never wore out while they traveled in the desert. The reason was logical. They didn't actually have to walk. The cloud was a sort of people mover. If they would have had to actually walk through the desert sands, can you imagine the sand that their feet and the hooves their animals would have kicked up would have made the camp unlivable. It would have been a virtual sandstorm. Everyone and everything would have been covered with sand. As I mentioned before, I served in the U.S. Army during my, and during my basic training. We marched in sand. There was only 150 men in my company, and we, cupped up, we kicked up so much sand as we marched that we were spitting up sand for hours afterwards. Now, one can only imagine how much sand two to three million people and their animals would produce. In addition, of course, there was a seventh cloud, that led them on all their travels and gave them heat and light at night. You know, there may well be another reason as to why Joy is mentioned three times in connection with the holiday of Sukkot, and yet there is no mention of Joy at all on Pesach, and only once men mention of Joy on Shavuot. Now on Pesach, we, we celebrate our redemption from the oppressive slavery in Egypt. That would seem like a great reason to celebrate. True, but it is a holiday we celebrate for the most part with our family. We do invite the poor to join us in our Seder. But if you look, that invitation is stated in the Haganah only after we are already seated at our table. The meal really has already begun. And even in the times of the temple, in order for a guest to participate in the Seder, they would have had to have been registered as a guest before the Paschal offering was brought up as a sacrifice. Well, that sacrifice was brought during the afternoon of the 14th, which is even before the holiday had begun on the 15th. So the fact that the holiday was celebrated, for the most part, mainly with family members, in a sense diminishes some of the joy. You know, we see with Noah, that Noah is criticized for not saving any of his generation. That may be true. However, he did save his whole family. So, so why wasn't he complimented for that fact? Well, protecting one's families and actions is common even to animals. Every animal in the world is created with an innate desire to protect their young. So what Noah did was totally within nature. Therefore, he is not complimented for that action, which may be another reason as to why there's no mention of joy on Pesach, since for the most part, we limit the celebration to our family. On Shavuos, there is only one reference to joy, well, this may be connected to the fact that on that special day we receive the Torah directly from God Almighty himself. But even more so, this was the only time in history that the whole Jewish nation was united as one. But that unity mm, was short-lived. It only lasted for that one day, one joyous day. However, when it comes to the holiday of Sukkot, we celebrate not only with our family, we also invite guests, both physical and spiritual guests. Now, the spiritual guests are referred to as the Ushbazin, seven of our illustrious ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moshe, Aaron, Yosef, and David, King David. They join us on each of the seven nights of Sukkot. 
They enter into our sukkah to celebrate with us in our joyous holiday. You know, we are told by the sages when then the Messiah will come, Mashiach, we will then all congregate together in one large sukkah. Total unity, a reason to truly celebrate. Now, in addition, the holiday of Sukkot is celebrated after the Day of Judgment, a time when we express our confidence that God our Father has forgiven all of our sins. You know, our sages tell us that the number three always creates what in Hebrew is referred to as a chazaka, an established precedence, something that we can be certain will occur again and again. So the joy that we experience on this holiday is not a temporary situation. Rather, we should continue to connect to that joy and happiness now and forever. So the miracles of the holiday of Pesach were limited to the children of Israel, those who were freed from their oppressive slavery in Egypt. However, it was not a complete redemption, since Moshe was only able to free the nation from their physical servitude. He was able to remove the nation from Egypt, but he was not able to remove Egypt from the nation. Hence, no mention of joy. Then on the holiday of Shavuot, again, only one mention of joy, since not only the Jewish nation, but both Christian and Muslims, some four billion people would accept in one form or another the written Torah given to the Jewish nation at Mount Sinai. However, on Sukkot, the whole world, including God Almighty himself, were able to celebrate equally at the same time. God celebrated the fact that, his, that the Jewish nation had done true tshuva and that he was able to forgive them. As a sign of his acceptance, he had them begin to construct a tabernacle, a house on earth, a place for him to dwell here together with his children. On this date, the Jewish nation celebrated the return of the Shekhinah, the divinity of God. In addition, they also celebrated the return of the clouds of glory. They, had, they now had tangible proof for all the world to see that God had forgiven them for the sin of the golden calf. Now the nations of the world were also included in the celebration of the holiday of Sukkot. They celebrated with the 70 oxen that were offered on their behalf in the temple during the seven days of the holiday. The Talmud tells us that if the nations of the world would have realized just how much benefit they received from those 70 sacrifices, they would have surrounded the temple with soldiers and never, never have allowed it to be destroyed. In addition, the holiday of Sukkot is when the whole world is judged for water. For all seven days of the holiday of Sukkot, the ritual of the pouring water on the altar was observed, which we was referred to as Simchas Beis HaShoeva, the rejoicing of the place of the drawing of the water. The Gemara, the tra tractate, the Talmud and tractate of Sukkot states that one who has not experienced the joy of this ritual has not truly experienced joy in their lifetime. So there is much for us to celebrate on this joyous holiday. The planting and harvesting season is over. The solemn days of judgment are over. In addition, we can be certain that our Father, our King, most certainly has accepted our repentance and we are destined for a year of revealed good. However, if we look again into the Torah, we notice that even after God had forgiven the nation for the sin of the golden calf, and additionally, he had told them to build a tabernacle for him, to reside in their midst as a proof of that forgiveness. Yet somehow, somehow they still sinned with despise. Somehow as much as they believed in reality, they really didn't believe completely. You know, we need to walk away from this holiday season with a, a strong and firm belief that our Father, God our Father loves us and He deserves that we should love Him in return. Cultivating that love should help us to overcome all the challenges that life presents. Fear? Fear is not an emotion that we should connect to our benevolent Father in Heaven. Even in times of difficulty, we need to see it as tough love, administered by a loving and caring parent. Love and awe, those should be our only connection to Him. We need to internalize the words that we say in the Ashray prayer, Psalm 145, three times daily. Korov l'chol Hashem l'chol korov l'chol asher yikru'u be'emes. Close, God is close to all who call upon Him, to all who call upon Him in truth. We need to know, 
with complete certainty that he is always with us in all that we do. And then, Ashrenu mato chalkenu mayafa yerushatenu. Fortunate are we. How good is our portion. How pleasant our lot. And how beautiful is our heritage. And with that thought in mind, let us enter into this year with the strength and confidence that this will be the year when we can finally usher in the coming of Mashiach Sukenu, Cain Yehi Ratzon. Again, may it be his will. Okay, let me thank you again for attending. Again, it's a big break we had, and I'm glad to be back. I hope you are as well. Again, may God put the joy in your heart, and may it never leave. Again, we have that achrayut, that responsibility. If we really believe that we have God, our Father, who loves us, how can we be anything but happy? Again, Shabbat Shalom. God should bless you with all that is good, safe, and healthy. Again, Shabbat Shalom. Thank you again.